Yes, Mr Hodge. Commissioner, the next witness is Ian Silk from Australian Super. Mr Silk, would you be good enough to come into the witness box? And can I begin by asking whether you'd prefer to make an oath or take an affirmation? Uh, I'll affirm, sir. Thank you. If you wouldn't mind standing. And if you'd be good enough to affirm, Mr Silk. I solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm. I solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence I shall give that the evidence I shall give will be the truth. Will be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Thank you, Mr. Silk. Do sit down. Thank you. <coughs> yes, Mr. O'Brien. Commissioner, um, Mr. Silk, is your full name Ian Scott Silk? Yes. Yes. And is your business address Level 26, 50 Lonsdale Street, Melbourne? Yes, it is. Yes. A and are you currently the Chief Executive of Australian Super Proprietary Limited? Yes, I am. Yes. Uh, Mr Silk, have you received a summons dated 31 July 2018 to give evidence and produce your signed witness statements? I have. Yes. A and do you have the summons with you? Yes, I do. Yes. I tender the summons. Exhibit 5.87, the summons to Mr Silk. Uh, and Mr Silk, uh, have you made a witness statement dated 30 July 2018 in response to the Royal Commission's rubric 5-01? Yes, I have. Yes. And do you have uh, a signed copy of that witness statement with you? I do. Yes. And are the contents of that witness statement true and correct to the best of your knowledge? Yes, they are. Yes. I tender that witness statement and the annexures to it, Commissioner. Witness state and annexures, 30 July 18, concerning rubric 5-01, exhibit 5.88. And Mr Silk, have you also made a second witness statement dated 31 July 2018 in response to the Royal Commission's rubric 5-60? Yes, I have. Yes. And you have that witness statement with you? I do. Yes. And are the contents of that witness statement true and correct to the best of your knowledge? Yes, they are. Yes. And I also tender that witness statement and the annexures there too. And further witness statement and annexures of 31 July 18, Exhibit 5.89. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Commissioner. Brian. Yes, Mr. Hodge. Thank you, Commissioner. <coughs> Mr. Silk, Australian Super is the or Australian Super Fund is the largest superannuation fund in Australia. Yes, it is. And it's also the largest holder of my super products in Australia. Yes, it is. And the majority of the assets invested, I'm sorry, the majority of the member accounts of with Australian Super are invested in my super assets. Correct. All right. And Australian Super was born out of a merger that occurred in 2006. That's right. And that was a merger between, was it three superannuation funds? Yes, there was one smaller fund called FinSuper and two large funds, Australian Retirement Fund and Superannuation Trust of Australia. And you were the CEO of Australia Australian Retirement Fund? Correct. And the other large fund was called what? Superannuation Trust of Australia or STA. And could you just explain to the Commissioner the mechanism of the merger? Was it a successor fund transfer from the two smaller funds into the Australian Retirement Fund, or was it done by some other means? Uh, it was a similar mechanism, but not into Australian Retirement Fund. Both FinSuper and Australian Retirement Fund formally merged into STA, Superannuation Trust of Australia, and simultaneously, this is on the 1st of July 2006, the name was changed to Australian Super. <coughs> and from that point, you've then been the CEO of Australian Super? That's correct. And I wanted to ask you some questions in relation to the way in which the rules for board positions have come about for Australian Super. Yes. Could you tell the Commissioner how many directors Australian Super presently has? Australian Super presently has 11 directors. And that's five member directors, five employer directors, and one independent director? That's right. And the present chair of the board is one of the employer directors? Correct, that's Heather Ridout. And 
Was there a change made to the constitution in 2007 dealing with the term or the Im importing term limits for directors? 2017. No. 2007, is that right? There might perhaps there's an error in the statement in paragraph 8.5. Which statement? Uh, this is the first statement of Mr. Silk. It's ASU.0019.0001.0590. And on page on dot zero six zero two, paragraph 8.5. Yes, I believe that was 2017. Could I trouble you, Mr. Silk, to uh, uh, make the amendment in handwriting and initial the amendment? Yes, thank you. Just before you do that, oh. Mr. Silk, I think, <laughs> <we're>, <laughs> I, th I think you're thinking of a different amendment. So, so I think if you, if you look two paragraphs on, in 8.7, you're dealing with the, you're, you're thinking of the amendment that was made in June I'm sorry. 2017. Yes, I am. <laughs> <laughs> well, I nearly led you into a perjury, Mr. Sorkin. <laughs> <laughs> so, just to clarify, there was an amendment made in 2007 to introduce term limits in relation to the directors? That's correct. And then there was another amendment made in June of 2017, which I think was in relation not to the Constitution but to the board renewal policy, to introduce a default maximum tenure? That's right, four by three year term, so a total of 12 years. And the way in which the board renewal policy interacts with the constitution is that the maximum tenure of 12 years under the policy applies to directors who are covered by clause 8.5 of the constitution? That's correct. And clause 8.5 is the clause that was introduced in December of 2007? That's right. And that was the clause that originally introduced a term limit? Correct. Which was a three-year term? That's right. And of the 11 directors that presently sit on the board of Australian Super, four of those directors are not covered by clause 8.5? That's correct. Those four directors were uh, in place prior to that change and it was a prospective change. And so those four directors are, and I think you explain this at page 14 of your statement beginning at paragraph 9.1. Ms Ridout, who is the present chair and was appointed on the 1st of July 2007? That's correct. And she is one of the employer directors? That's right. And then Mr Oliver, who is the deputy chair, he is one of the member directors? Yes. And he was appointed on the 1st of July 2007? Yes. And so again, clause 8.5 doesn't apply to him? Correct. And then the third director is Mr Willis? Yes. And he is, an, again, an employer director? That's right. And he was appointed as a director. I think you say in your statement he was appointed as a director in June of 1988. That was of a predecessor fund, is that right? That's correct. Must was a predecessor of STA. And so, as you've explained already, in 2006 there was this merger of STA and the retirement fund and the smaller fund. Correct and he continued on as a director of the new entity. That's right. And then the fourth director is Mr Daly? Yes. And he's a member director? Correct. And so there are four directors who aren't covered at all by the term limits? That, that is true as we sit here today, but the shareholders are formally reviewing that position at the moment um, and are uh, considering whether to include those four directors into the same term limit arrangements that apply to all the other directors. I see. And does the board of the trustee, so separate from the shareholders, does the board of the trustee have a view as to whether term limits should apply to all directors? I'm sorry, I should say tenure limits. Tenure limits? Tenure limits, yes. Um, 
by implication, because it was the board that um, authorised a letter to be sent from the company secretary to the two shareholders, inviting them to reconsider the current arrangements. Do you know why the current arrangements are as they are? That is, why was this, why was it only prospective that Clause 8.5 operated? I don't know. Right. But in any event, of the four directors who are presently excluded from the application of Clause 8.5, they are part of this board that has formally asked the shareholders to reconsider the That's position. That's correct. All right. Now... And I might say that was a unanimous resolution of the board. So. And in relation to independent directors, there is only one independent director, as I think you've already explained, on the board. That's right. And does the board have a position as to whether there should be more independent directors on the board of Australian Super? Uh, the board has discussed that and is open to that, but the board's starting position is that rather than the structure of the board be defined by, for example, a third dir director as being independent, the more important consideration is that the board is comprised of appropriately skilled and qualified and experienced people. And so that's their overriding starting point for the optimum composition of the board, the optimum structuring of the board. And so in order for the board to be satisfied that it has the right composition in terms of skills, does it develop some sort of matrix when a board seat becomes vacant to determine whether or what the necessary skills are for that position? Yes, so the board maintains a skills matrix and when a position becomes vacant, a letter goes from the trustee office to the relevant shareholder advising that there is a vacancy, um, advising of any relevant skill issues that the shareholder is invited to <coughs> consider when nominating uh, a representative back to the board. And when that nomination comes back to the board, the board considers it against the um, skills matrix considers all the other accompanying documentation, including curriculum vitae, reference checks and the like, and has the authority to decline it. So the board has the authority to not accept the nominee and return it to the shareholder and invite them to reconsider. <coughs> and is that under the constitution or under the a policy of the company? Uh, it's certainly under the policy. I'm not sure whether it's under the constitution. And what happens if the board declines to accept the nomination, but the appointing shareholder insists? How does, how would that sort of deadlock be resolved? The, the shareholder cannot insist. Um, if there was a deadlock, to use that term, then no appointment would be made. But in practical terms, there'd be negotiations between the board on the one hand and the shareholder on the other to, to reach an agreed position. And has this happened on a few occasions in the last few years? The filling of a vacancy or...? The filling of a vacancy. Yes, this has happened. We currently have four directors on the board who've served less than two years. So it's happened four times in the last two years. Right. I want to move then to a second topic. Just, just before you do, you say the shareholder cannot insist. Can you uh, expand that and tell me why the shareholder cannot insist yes. on the nominee? Because the board has the authority to make the formal appointment. We, we use different uh, terminology. We say the shareholder can appoint, but the board must confirm the appointment. Or sometimes we say the the shareholder can nominate and the board appoints, but the practical effect is the same. Yeah, I uh, can be expressed diplomatically or not diplomatically, <laughs> I'm sure, but uh, if push comes to shove, uh, do I understand it that the board has the final say? The board has the clear final say. Yes. And perhaps to assist with this, Commissioner, can we bring up 
the current constitution of Australian super, which is ASU.0013.0001.0001, which should be exhibit ISS-1.1 to the, I think this will be the first statement of Mr Silk. If we go to page.0014. We should go back a step first. We go to page.0012. So this is providing, Commissioner, you'll see clause 8.1, the company must have an equal number of A-class directors and B-class directors. And I assume, Mr Silk, that an A-class director is an employer is I, I, sorry, an A-class director is the union appointed director? Yes, that's right. And the B-class director uh, is the director appointed by Australian industry? Correct. Which is the employer that's right. represented body? Yes. And then if we go over to clause 8.3, which is on page 0014, <coughs> Commissioner, you'll see 8.31, the appointment and removal of A-class directors and B-class directors must be ratified by the board and will take effect from a date determined by the board. So that, I think, in answer to the question I asked earlier, which is, is yes, it I'll under the Constitution? Yes. It seems to be the Constitution. Thank you. Did you want to ask anything further no, about no. that, Commissioner? Thank you. I want to move now, Mr Silk, to the second topic, which is the new daily and commissioner to assist with dealing with this can i just tender a statement of paul schroeder the doc id is asu.0018.0001.0372 i believe the solicitors for australian super have a signed final original signed copy of the statement and the statement is of what date? First. Have we got a the date first, on it? The 1st of August, Commissioner. 1st of August. A statement of Paul Yarn Schroeder, um, 1st of August uh, 2018, ASU, uh, 0018 0001 uh, Exhibit 5.90. Thank you, Commissioner. Mr Silk. Mr Schroeder is a group executive within Australian Super? That's correct. And he's given the statement in response to some questions that the Commission had asked about the investment by Australian Super in the New Daily? Yes. We haven't required Mr Schroeder to attend to give evidence. We're hoping, and I think we've indicated this to Australian Super, that to the extent that we need assistance or the Commissioner needs assistance with this, that you're able to address some of these issues in relation to New Daily? Yes. And I assume you have at least some level of familiarity with the New Daily? I have some level of familiarity, yes. Quite. So, as we understand it, in 2012, a proposal was made for Australian Super to invest in the New Daily? Yes. And. To help, can we bring up ASU.0018.0001.0087? This is an item from the Member and Employer Services Committee meeting, and it's been prepared by Mr. Coyle, could you yes. just explain to the Commissioner who Mr. Coyle was? Uh, Mr. Is? Coyle no longer works at Australian Super, but he was uh, the group executive responsible for marketing at this time. And? Marketing and communications, I think. And he explains in this memo, I should confirm, you've seen this before. Yes, I've I seen have. this memo. He explains in this memo that the industry super network 
have approached Australian Super about investing or developing in a online daily newspaper. Yes. And at that time, it was to be known as Free News. That's correct. And ultimately, it became known as the New Daily. Yes. And then if we go to page two of that document... sets out, we can see there the various pros and cons that were to be considered as part of the investment. Yes. I've used the word investment. Yes. That I think is probably misleading. As I understand it, it wasn't an investment in the sense that ultimately when Australian Super acquired shares in the relevant company, they weren't acquired as an asset of the fund. That, that's correct. Um, It was offered, the shares in Australia, in uh, the New Daily or Free News were offered to Australian Super. We ultimately accepted that invitation. But they were not, um, as Mr Hodge says, an asset in the portfolio of assets of the fund. Instead, they were paid for out of the $1.50 per week member fee. So the, the fund has two sets of costs, if you like. A member fee of $1.50 a week or $78 a year, and that pays for all non-investment costs of the fund, uh, including marketing and the like, and it was paid out of that source, not an asset of the fund. And does that reflect the fact that it, the acquisition of an interest in the New Daily wasn't perceived by Australian Super as being an investment intended to generate a v investment return for the members? That was our judgment, yes. And rather, it was seen as something like a marketing tool? Yes, it was, it was seen as a tool to enhance the fund's engagement with members. And can you just explain that a little bit more? Because I wonder whether... I've used the term marketing, which would suggest it's about marketing to non members to try to attract them to the fund, but I think you're not agreeing with that. You're suggesting that it was about something else. Uh, if I could give uh, some context here, um, as Mr Hodge said in his opening yesterday, superannuation is um, a compulsory product. It's relatively complex, which means that many of the people uh, who are members of superannuation funds, and this is certainly true of Australian super, are not engaged with superannuation, much less their fund. And also, as Mr Hodge said, there's a significant um, issue in the community at large about numeracy and literacy, and in particular financial numeracy and literacy. So put all those factors together, you might expect that the superannuation industry is a very stable, inert sort of industry with a whole lot of disengaged people. Notwithstanding those characteristics, it's a very active industry as the um, <coughs> May draft report of the Productivity Commission um, reported, there's more than two million buying decisions each year. Um, the Productivity Commission estimated there were, I think, 450,000 people who enter the workforce. There's around 1.5 to 1.6 million, per this is annually, 1.5 to 1.6 million people who change jobs or re-enter the workforce. And by their numbers, there's 220,000 people who switch superannuation funds each year unrelated to a change in employment. So there's over 2 million decisions which go to joining a fund or electing to remain a member of a fund. In Australian Super's case, uh, we have more than 200,000 members each year that leave the fund which means that we need to replace those members and hopefully more than leave because economies of scale and our capacity to leverage those economies of scale for the benefit of members is at the very heart of how the fund operates. So as a result of all of that, we're very keen to retain as many members in the fund as we can and, where possible, recruit new members. And the New Daily was seen as a vehicle to assist us in that. That is 
to both retain existing members and also to, to some extent, gain new members. Yes, that, that was very much a, a secondary consideration. This was, Gaining new members. Yes. It was principally about retaining members because the economies of scale, which are so important to the operation of the fund, depend on retaining members as well as gaining. And what's the logic behind saying there's a free newspaper, free online newspaper that's being distributed to members and that will therefore lead to members staying with the fund? Mm. So we have, in, in terms of um, a strategy to retain as many members as possible, we have a, a multi-pronged approach, more than a dozen particular activities that are directed to, the, to that objective. Um, and each of them are directed to achieving one of two, um, preferably both objectives. One is to remind people that they are a member of the fund, reinforce with them that they are a member of Australian Super. Bearing in mind this is a low engagement product, most people default into the fund, they don't elect to choose the fund. So this is a, it's an important part of their membership of the fund. Yes, I'm a member of Australian Super, that's right. They've contacted me about this or that. Um, and secondly, having made that contact, seek to communicate with them means by which they can increase their retirement savings. And we, we talk about a, a range of actions that they can take. So the idea with the new daily was to um, send them a publication, the New Daily, and for the receipt of, in the receipt of, by receipt of that publication to be reminded that Australian Super, my super fund, has um, been involved in the provision of this service to me. And in the content of the New Daily, um, approximately 20 to 30 per cent of the content is superannuation or finance related. So to the extent they read it, Hopefully the numeracy and financial literacy issue we spoke of before might be addressed at least in part. Now, when, it was, when Australian Super initially acquired its interest in the New Daily, it acquired that by purchasing, I think, two million partly paid shares, is that That's right? That's correct, yes. And they were partly paid in the sense that the initial capital contribution made by Australian Super was $1 million. That's correct. And then at some stage, the further capital contribution of another $1 million yes, was Yes, about 12 months later. And one of the things I'm interested in understanding is if we just pull down that table and pop out the paragraph above, you see it says, in order to serve this purpose, free news, which as we talked about was what the yes. New Daily was originally to be called, must not however be a house journal and reflect the industry fund view of the world. A charter of editorial independence will need to be signed and adhered to by the owners. I, I'm, what I'm interested in <coughs> understanding is, first, do you know whether that ultimately occurred? Yes, there is a um, charter of editorial independence. And the second thing is, I'm not sure I understand why it's in the interests of members for the trustee of the fund to acquire or put out a publication that doesn't reflect its view of the world. Yes. The, uh, it's not my document, of course, but I, I think I understand what is being sought to be communicated here. Um, What I think is intended to be communicated, because we did speak about this, was that we didn't want to have a document that was overtly branded, overtly appeared to be just another publication from the superannuation fund, because uh, sadly too many of those find their way to the waste paper basket without being read. So it was really in that context that that comment's made. Now once the, once the New Daily started in publication, the original shareholders were Australian Super, CBUS and 
was it an industry super? Industry super holdings, ISH. All right. So, and did each of those companies own a third of the new daily? Or yes, I believe so. All right. And it attracted controversy, the publication of the new daily? Yes, some controversy. Was that expected? Uh, it was not unexpected. We uh, identified that as a risk in proceeding with that venture. And APRA contacted Australian Super about the publication? Yes, it did. And we might bring that up, which is ASU.0018.0001.0119. I think this is actually the response of Australian Super to an email that it received from APRA querying the decision. But I take it after this response there wasn't further engagement with APRA? Uh, yes, there was uh, communication from APRA because the New Daily had been raised at a parliamentary committee, I think a select, Senate Select Committee or Senate Economics Committee, um, and the APRA representative there contacted me to um, seek similar information as contained here as to the basis for our involvement with the New Daily. Well, we might come back to that in a moment. Th that was in relation to the New oh. Daily and not in relation to yes. Fox and yeah. Henhouse? I think you're right. I'm sorry. That's it's right. in relation to Fox yes. and Henhouse. that's right. Um, so the New Daily was raised in um, some discussions we had with APRA, but I, I don't recall any other formal exchanges with them on this issue. All right. But you also wrote to Senator Sinodinos in relation to the New Daily? Correct. If we bring that up, that's ASU.0018.0001.0170. And this was in response, I think, to some comments that may have been made by Senator Sinodinos in public. That's correct. And he'd expressed some concern about the New Daily? Yes, he had. And then if we then bring up ASU.0018.0001.0171. And this is the response from Senator Sindinos. He was then the Assistant Treasurer. That's correct, yes. And one of the things I'm interested in understanding is you see his sentence in the middle of the page, which is the government, as per my public statement, remains concerned that the publication only be used as an engagement tool and not to progress any broader policy or political position. Yes. And I understand your position is the New Daily was just an engagement tool, yes. is that right? But I'm interested in understanding because it will tie into the next issue we're going to deal with, this position that it cannot be used to progress any broader policy or political position. Yes. Does Australian Super have a view as to whether it can use the fees that it collects to push a policy position in relation to superannuation? Absolutely. We believe we can use fees, member fees, to advocate for policies that we believe are to the benefit of the fund's members. And we might come to the, to the detail of that in a moment then when we get to Fox and Hen House. 
in relation to the new daily, do you recall having received some emails from a journalist about it? Yes, I do. And we might just bring that up. That's ASU.009.0002.0260. document annexed to a statement or is it uh, no commissioner it, it may be I don't have it as an extract but I have it the document ID is ASU.0009.0002.0260 but it's I suspect part of a board pack supplied to the board of Australian super the yes that's correct all right I'll try ASU.0009.0002.0260. Right, that's the second page of the document, but in any event, you provided a chief executive's report to the board for their meeting on the 12th of December 2013. Yes. And the part that we see there is a reference to the New Daily and some things that you have said to the board about the New Daily. Yes, that's right. And then I think annexed or attached to that was a chain of emails that you'd exchanged with a journalist named Michael Lawrence. That's right. And well, I should check, Commissioner. Can we just... Is that subject to a non-publication direction? I suspect it's not. It'll be fine. Can we then bring up page.0263? I just ask you the questions, Mr. Silk. Yes. I suspect you'll remember the issue. Initially, one of the ways in which this story was reported was that Australian Super had made an investment in the New Daily. Yes. And that created the type of confusion that you and I have already discussed because if it was an investment, Australian Super would be looking to earn a return in financial terms from the New Daily. Yes, that's or right. A direct return as yes. distinct from retaining membership. And so initially the query that was raised with you was why is Australian Super investing in the New Daily? Yes. And then you explained that wasn't the case, that it was being used for member engagement, which you've already referred to. Yes. And then the question that was put to you in response to that, which I'm interested in understanding your <coughs> view of, is why is the investment in the new daily as a member engagement tool a worthwhile use of that $78 a year per member so I'll ask you that first and then I have some further questions about that so I said it, this is part of a, a multi-pronged approach um, have to see this in the context of our of those that multi-pronged approach. For example, 
a direct mail out, a one-off direct mail out to Australian Super's members costs $2.3 million. We are coming off a low base of engagement and we're trying to improve our ability to engage meaningfully with members. This was a new and innovative approach. It was our best judgment that it was worth trying this um, because heaven knows most techniques that we've used and the industry at large have used have not been successful if you look at the, the level of disengagement. We thought it was a, a worthwhile service to provide to members on the basis that it may yield the engagement dividends I was speaking about earlier. What was the connection that the member drew or was able to draw between publication and Oz Super? Um, in the first instance, we emailed fund members for whom we had an email address and alerted them to the publication, the fact that they could participate in it. Um, we are also hamstrung by, by our own approach. We had conflicting legal advice through this period as to whether, not as to whether we could provide the service, but how we could provide it. Um, could we provide it on an opt-out basis or an opt-in basis? <coughs> in the event we started providing it on an opt-in basis, and as you might expect, the, um, the numbers who availed themselves of that were relatively modest. Um, of recent times, in an endeavour to measure the success of the New Daily in achieving both the engagement objective and the, um, the role it might play in assisting members making smart uh, decisions in relation to their superannuation, we have, from the start of this year, begun a 12-month trial and members who join online are being um, receiving the new, the new Daily unless they opt out. And we're going to compare the engagement factor of that group and the decisions they've made uh, over the course of the 12 months with a control group. So that at the end of this year, we think we'll have as good an idea as we can as to whether the two objectives, in particular the, re the retention and engagement objective, has been achieved. And when each edition or issue arrives in the inbox, does the recipient uh, have any overt cue connecting the receipt of the publication with Oz Super? Not on an ongoing basis. Um, or at all? Uh, well, initially, because they... Either opt-in or opt-out. Correct. I understand that, but correct. beyond that... that that's correct. Yes. Now, one of the other things that was suggested to you was rather than becoming effectively the owner of a media company, that Oz Super could simply afford to lower the administration fee. Yes. You've made the point, well, this came out of our dollar fifty a week fee that we were charging in any event. But I do want to understand that. Why isn't it the case that Australian Super couldn't say, well, we're not going to spend $2 million acquiring the New Daily and instead we're going to lower the administration fee? Now, to be fair, it's probably going to equate to, I would guess, 90 cents in one year for all of the members. But nevertheless, why couldn't it do that? Uh, we, we certainly wouldn't have lowered the administration fee. Uh, it was a $2 million one-off payment from the time we've made it to now. It works out about $0.20 cents per annum per member. If we continue in it for some years to come, then that figure obviously declines. It was a, in the context of our overall marketing budget, and I'll back up here, $2 million is serious money in anybody's language. We're a member's focused organisation. We don't splash money around lightly. So $2 million this expenditure was not made lightly. I think you've seen the significant material that um, occurred through the organisation, including at board level, before the final decision was made. But it was made on the basis of our judgement that that relatively 
small amount of money in the context of our multi-pronged marketing approach was worth spending. I think the, to take the first part of what you said, you're effectively saying, look, whether we spent $2 million on this or not was not going to have an effect on what our administration fee was. No. The, the funds administration fee was last set in 2009 at $1.50. It's remained at that level to this point. Um, in the interest of full disclosure, I'll say we are reviewing that, but it has been frozen at that level for, um, or since 2009, and it simply wouldn't have been a realistic prospect to decline this option of participating in the new daily and <coughs> reducing the dollar fifty. The fee that is charged, the dollar fifty fee per week, is that is that charged as remuneration to the trustee that the trustee can then spend in any way that it wants, or is it effectively a limit on the amount of indemnity that the trustee is going to take against the fund each year? Um, that may be a legal question that yes, uh, you're not able to readily answer. Yes, I'll... Can you rephrase the question? What I'm, what I'm trying to understand is, and I suppose you can look at it in this way, you charge all your members $78 a year, and then for certain categories of members, there'll be a percentage administration fee for a very limited number of members, I think, in yes. the retirement product. Correct. If Australian Super doesn't incur costs that rise to the full level of that $78 per member per year, yes. what happens to the balance? That money is retained in the fund for future use, for members. As Is it effectively set aside as part of some sort of reserve? It's into an administration reserve, um, the only purpose of which is spending on member services. Right. Now, ultimately, there came a point when the operators of the New Daily said that they needed further funding to continue. That's right. And at that point in time, Australian Super said it didn't want to provide further funding. That's correct. And instead, the New da the company that operates the New Daily was then wholly acquired by ISH. That's right, which had been a part owner. And the consideration that was paid by ISH to each of CBS prior and Super for the share, their shares in the New Daily Company was zero? Yes, I think by that stage there were four additional shareholders. Oh, I'm sorry, um, yes. Mr Donnelly points that out, that there were some additional shareholders yes. that had invested. But the consideration paid to the other shareholders was zero, is that Correct. right? And can you explain to the Commissioner how that came about, that this investment, is about the investment, this acquisition for $2 million ultimately ended up getting sold to industry super holdings for nothing? Yes. So the, the New Daily um, approached us, um, sought additional funding from Australian Super. We were not convinced that it was um, operating as successfully as we would have hoped. We were in a, a state where we hadn't reached a definitive decision as to its success or otherwise, um, because we didn't have the data that the trial I spoke of earlier will hopefully provide. Uh, and in the event we declined to participate, um, the New Daily came back with ISH and said that they would, well, they were prepared to acquire it uh, for zero consideration, that being the valuation, um, and would operate the New Daily on an ongoing basis and that we would were free to continue to use its services. And so what, now was, what was New Daily's revenue stream? Uh, it was principally advertising. And is the New Daily, do you know now, self-funding? No, I believe it is not. 
So it has to continue to be supported by ISH? Correct. ISH is owned by a number of industry funds? That's right. One of which is Australian Super? Correct. And just to be clear, it's the fund rather than the trustee in its personal capacity that owns the interest in ISH, is that that's right? That's right. The fund has an investment into ISH and that's part of the investment portfolio. And has ISH ever produced a dividend, do you know? Yes, it has. Right. Is that a re relatively recent uh, I can't recall when, but it, it has proven to be uh, a very successful investment for the fund. It's written up um, about 30% in the last financial year. Sorry, in the... I'm sorry, it's written up about 30% in the last financial year. Yes. It's worth around $900 million. At some point in time, did Australian Super, the fund, sell down part of its stake yes. in yes, ISH? Yes, it did. And did it sell that down at a profit? Yes, it did. Right. And when was that? Uh, that transaction would have been completed um, about 12 months ago. I want to, Commissioner, I was going to move off the New Daily to the last topic, which is... Can I just stay with New Daily a moment? At the time of determining whether or not to acquire, uh, did Australian Super have any view about what kind of voice New Daily would add to the media landscape? This is at the time of the original acquisition? At the time of ac acquisition. Uh, the intention was to provide uh, an online publication that was directed at, um, I'll, I'll say middle Australia. Um, <laughs> Forgive me if I smile, everyone says it's directed at middle Australia, <laughs> Mr Silk, yes. Um, okay, I'll try and be a bit more specific. <laughs> um, directed at the sort of people who are the bread and butter members of industry funds, and in our case, Australian super. Um, and so there's a, the, the sort of um, sections that you find in general media, but th this was directed at a not, a, not a tabloid style format, um, a little above tabloid, but specifically directed to the interests of um, not working class, but working Australians. And adding what kind of voice to the media landscape? Well, the, the particularly distinctive part of the New Daily was intended to be its focus on superannuation and financial matters. As I said, uh, 20 to 30 per cent of the publication was to be directed in that area. And that's, that's far from uh, the norm in any general media that we were aware of. And is that the voice that it developed? Uh, well, it, it has stayed true to the 20 to 30 per cent content in superannuation and financial services. Um, that was the particularly attractive part for us, so I would say yes. Yes. The last... Oh, I'm sorry, I tender that document, Commissioner. The CEO report of uh, 12 December 13. To get, could you say together with attachment? Is that, Commissioner, would you mind saying? At the moment, I haven't said anything, Mr Hodge. <laughs> uh, but am I right? It's the CEO report of 12 December 13 and, and its attachments, do you want? I'm sorry, it's, it's the CEO report for the meeting of the 12th of December 2013. The report itself is dated the 30th of November 2013. Yes. And uh, also together. And its attachments. attachments? Yes, please, Commissioner. Right, are we on the one page now, Mr. Yes, Hodge? Thank Good. you, Commissioner. We are. Uh, ASU 0009 0002 0260 becomes Exhibit 5.91. Just one last question about you, Daly. Uh, Mr. Silk, 
at the time of the original acquisition, was it any part of the purpose of New Daily that it would act uh, as a voice for or a voice about superannuation and in particular industry superannuation? Uh, yes, Commissioner. Yes. And is that a voice which it has maintained in the period since acquisition up until the point of your divestiture into ISH? Uh, yes, I would say so, and, and subsequently. Uh, so, uh, if I might just explain that yes, answer. Sir. Um, you say a voice for superannuation. The, the, the publication does frequently have superannuation articles, seeks to demystify superannuation for the readers. I'm happy to arrange a subscription if you'd Thank like. Thank you so <laughs> much, Mr Silk. Thank you so very much, yes. <laughs> Um, seeks to de demystify superannuation for the sceptics and, and lists means by which members can increase their superannuation savings, uh, actions that they can take, practical actions that they can take to ultimately uh, increase their retirement savings and have a greater lump sum at the point of retirement. Yes. Could I just ask a follow-up question to that? And when I ask this question, Commissioner, it's in no way intended as a criticism of your question, but I think, I think you may have been asked... What the Commissioner was really asking <laughs> was, Mr Silk, is the preface. I, Go on. I think you may have been asked a compound question, which was, was it intended to be a voice for superannuation and was it specifically intended to be a voice for industry funds? And I think you've addressed the voice for superannuation was it also intended to be a voice for industry funds and advocate for the position of industry funds? In the sense of um, advocating in relation to the positive features of industry funds, um, I suspect we'll get onto this in the, the topic you've foreshadowed, but um, the difference between the best funds and the poorest funds is literally life-changing for a lot of people. And to advocate for superannuation, in particular for the best superannuation funds, the funds that produce the best returns for members, is in the DNA of industry funds. And we were happy to see the, the New Daily do that, not be a... a um, a thoughtless cheerleader for industry funds, but where there are merits of those funds and where people are best served by being members of those funds, then we think it's important to point those features out to people. So again, the, the answer then is yes, it was originally intended to be a voice also in favour of industry funds. Where the, where the facts warrant that and we say in most cases the facts do warrant that and to come back to the point we looked at earlier which was editorial independence yes how does that fit with editorial independence i think you've received the or the commission has received the charter of editorial independence it um labors the point almost to death about the fact that it's to to be um editorially independent but again I, I come back to the point that where the facts warrant it to advocate on behalf of industry funds is entirely consistent with that so I was going to move to the last topic which is fox and hen house i just actually need to ask you about one other small thing which is about cash returns yes could we bring up mr silk's second statement which is ASU.0020.0001.0273. And can we go to page 26 of that statement, which is dot zero two nine eight.
this is a table, I think, setting out in response to some questions that the Commission asked about investments that are labelled as cash investments. Yes. And the way in which an investment with Australian Super can work is that a member can opt not to go into the default product. Yes. And the member can go into effectively a customised investment option that they might choose. That's right. And there will be various, I think you call them pre-mixed options or do-it-yourself mix options. Yes. And then there's also a further direct investment available. Yeah, we call that member direct. And in relation to the pre-mix, I'm sorry, in relation to the do-it-yourself mix options, it's possible to invest wholly in cash. Correct. And I think in this table you're setting out if you were invested wholly in cash, yes. first, what you're being invested in, and second, what the return is that's been generated over each of the last three financial years. That's correct. And if it appears as if, if you're invested wholly in cash, you're also exposed to what you describe as non-cash securities. Yes, or you were at the time of this document being prepared. Right, that's no longer the case? That's correct. And now if you're invested in cash, you're invested wholly in cash? Correct. And are you able to say what difference that has made to the return? The, the change from <coughs> the exposure of around 2% to 0%? Yes. Uh, no, I'm not able to do that because this has only occurred in the last couple of months. Um, but I would, I would say with some confidence it would be a, a modest difference by virtue of the fact that we're talking about, uh, in the case of these figures, 2.35% of the portfolio. So I think that oh, I'm sorry, 1.83% of the portfolio. Yes, and then the, re the average return is 2.35%. Correct. Yes. So when you're talking about some modest change, a modest change to the 2.35 per cent. Correct. That's right. And if you are wholly invested in cash, yes. That average return, I assume, it said it's pre-tax. Would it also be pre-fees, or is that post-fees? No, this will be post-fees. All right. So fees that, will be very modest on on cash. And that presumably that will mean first the $78 per year administration fee. No. Or is uh, that, that doesn't include the $78? Correct, that okay. doesn't include the $78. All right, so it would include the, I think, 0.05% investment management fee that applies just to cash? No. Um, oh, I'm sorry, yes, that's correct. That's correct. But it wouldn't include the $78? That's right. And so then the $78 would come off whatever that return is, which That's is going to, it's a fixed fee, so it'll depend what the balance is. Exactly right. right. Thank you. And what was the reason for going from having the approximately 2% exposure to non-cash options to no exposure to non-cash options? So APRA wrote to, a, I think all super funds, but certainly to a large number, including Australian super, um, a couple of months ago, uh, advising that during their supervision activities, they would identified a number of cash options which had a substantial proportion of assets in them that were non-cash and that members that might have been expecting uh, not just a return of cash but the volatility of a cash option um, were really invested in a way that they had not bargained for and um, asking funds to review their cash options and to make them true to label. Ours were, uh, we thought, very close to true to label, only having 2.35 per cent, uh, sorry, 1.83 per cent of assets other than cash. But uh, immediately upon receipt of that letter, we instructed the manager to revert to a 100 per cent cash portfolio. Commissioner, I want to now deal with the last issue, which is Fox and Hen House. Yes. There are, there are, we think, a few different 
versions of the Fox and Hen House advertisement, Mr Silk? Uh, I'm only aware of one final one. There, there, may, be, there may be others. There, when you say one final one, I think one is the finishes with a website which is banks aren't super yes. and there's another one that finishes with help save our super right okay do you yes. know which one yes. is which no I'm, okay i'm not w was it was it the case that fox and hen house was a campaign developed by isa isa in conjunction with a number of its constituent funds and isa is a wholly owned subsidiary of ish that's correct and ISA provides, amongst other things, marketing services to funds? Uh, it provides, strictly speaking, it provides marketing services on behalf of funds in a, in a collective sense. So it doesn't provide marketing services to an individual fund, but it does to the, the group of members of ISA. And does it also provide research by or on behalf of industry funds? Yes, it does. And what are the other activities that ISA undertakes? Uh, its principal activities are marketing related and um, policy related. Um, and policy can involve um, liaison with government, making submissions to parliamentary inquiries, issuing uh, discussion papers, research papers and the like. I might just so we know what we're talking about. I'll I'll play one video first. I may not get the right one, so then I just need to figure that out. But can we bring up ISA.0031.0001.0012? Bedtime. Good night, Doris. The big banks want to get their hands on your super. And they're putting pressure on our federal politicians to let them in. Banks aren't super. Authorised by D. Whiteley for Industry Super Australia, Melbourne. Was that the final version of the ad, do you know? Uh, I don't know, but it's horribly close to the final version if it's not the actual final version. All right, I think there's a, there's a slightly different version, which, as I said, has a slightly different website and has a slightly different voiceover where it refers to putting pressure on the federal government rather than putting pressure uh, on federal politicians. No, no, that the federal government version as, as far as I'm aware, uh, was not the final version and has not been used. All right. And that version also doesn't have the ISA logo at the end, I think. No, I don't know about that. All right. And can you then just explain to the Commissioner, or I'll take you through to the Commissioner, the process of the development of this ad and what exactly it is that it's trying to achieve? Yes. Do you remember when the concept of the ad was first developed? Uh, so this is the third in a series of advertisements that go to the issue of the appropriateness of um, banks in superannuation and the issue of how the default fund system works. Um, Perhaps I might explain how the default system works in superannuation. So, as we've discussed, uh, superannuation is a, a low engagement product for individuals and employers have at least one default system that operates at their workplace. Some employers have a number of default funds to apply in relation to different cohorts of workers. And an employer will 
typically select the default fund or funds to apply at their workplace from a selection available to them or the only option available to them through an industrial instrument, in particular an industrial award or an enterprise agreement. And the, uh, the import of the default fund for an employer is that they will make the superannuation contributions due to an individual into the default fund that the employer has selected unless the employee specifically nominates the fund that they want their superannuation contributions paid into. And because superannuation is a uh, low engagement issue for individuals, most superannuation contributions turn out to be default contributions and therefore end in the fund chosen by the employer. In Australian super's case, uh, 15 years or so ago, I'd say that number would have been 95%, maybe even higher. Today that figure is 70% and declining but declining slowly. So default, the choice of the default fund is very important. And um, again, the Productivity Commission report in May, I think, emphasises with all the subtlety of a sledgehammer how important it is. They had what they call cameos, which were examples. And one example, um, with all, all the assumptions being identical between the two cases, was for a 21-year-old starting salary of $50,000, retiring at 67, if they went into a top quartile performing fund versus a, top, a bottom quartile performing fund, they'd receive $570,000 at retirement, in the case of the bottom quartile fund, and $1.2 million for the top quartile fund. I, I, I don't want to interrupt you, Mr Silk, but is the point you're trying to make that your fund generates higher returns than a bank fund? Uh, well, that is the case. That's not really the point I'm trying to make. I'm, I'm trying to make the point that the selection of a default fund is critically important to the retirement outcome of individuals. That it's I, I say, I, again, I, just for, to manage this, I understand this ad is, you're saying, is concerned with default funds? Yes. And you're making the point that depending on what fund you default into can have a significant yes. effect on the return that you generate over your working life. Yes. That though is not direct, the ad is not an informative ad about the effect of default funds that doesn't have the pretty no. examples from the Productivity no. Commission. So it's, it's concerned with doing something else. Yes. Perhaps the f first question might be, who is the target audience for the ad? Uh, the, the target audience is, there are, there are multiple audiences. Um, the ultimate audience um, is a narrow audience, and that's um, members of the federal parliament. But the broader initial foundational audience, if you like, is uh, men and women of Australia who are members of superannuation funds and to alert them to what was proposed. So to your point, Mr Hodge, the purpose of the advertisement was to um, was our endeavours to prevent a lobbying effort that was being undertaken by retail wealth management companies, in particular the big banks, to change the default system from a framework that we say provided significant protection for workers to one that exposed workers to significant risks of mis-selling, cross-selling and conflicts of interest that would have done them significant damage. So when the ad or the idea of the ad first started being developed, I think that was in was it 2015 that it first began being yes. conceived of. And then in 2016, I'm sorry, Commissioner, before I bring up a document, I should tender the ad. What's the description, Mr Hodge? An advertisement titled 
Fox, Fox and in the Hen House. House. I think Fox and Hen House, I keep being corrected. Oh, is it? About that commissioner. Right. ISA what? Dot zero zero three one dot triple zero one dot zero zero one two. Exhibit five point nine two. And can we bring up ASU dot triple zero nine dot triple zero two dot one three zero zero? So this is a report of yours dated the 6th of September 2016 to the Board of Directors of Australian Super? Yes, it is. And if we go to page two of that document and item 4.2, you see ISA, ISA management is preparing a proposal for consideration by their board as to when to deploy the Fox and Hen House advertisement whilst there is still a discussion at the board level as to the timing of the advertisement, it is agreed that it represents an important part of the strategy to maintain industry funds as the predominant default superannuation funds in Australia. Yes. Now, again, don't. when I'm critical of the use of the passive voice, it's not specific to you, uh, you see it says it is agreed that, it is agreed by whom? Who was it that had agreed that this was an important part of the strategy, do you recall? Was it the board or was it an ISA issue? Uh, that was an ISA position that was similarly held by the Australian Super Board. Now, at some point in time, the Australian Super Board had not been prepared to participate in the Fox and Hen House campaign, is that right? That's correct. And was that at this time, that is in 2016, when your report is going up to the board, or was that at some earlier time? Uh, this, this was in the period leading up to a federal election, and the board was concerned to um, take a a prudent and cautious approach to the airing of the advertisement, lest that the organisation be accused of um, adding to the, the typical febrile atmosphere around elections. So um, Australian Super's position was not to participate due to the timing of the election as opposed to the substance of the uh, advertisement. So, and I hope I'm not getting the timing wrong, the, the federal election was in 2016, is yes. that right? Yes, yes. And in the middle of 2016? Yeah, July, I think it was. So, there, at some point in time before this paper, there'd been some discussion that had occurred at the board level about Fox yes, and I believe Hennets. that was the, the June board meeting. And so, the advertisement had already been developed by then? Uh, if it hadn't been finalised, it was certainly in development, yes. And did it end up getting run at all during 2016? Um, I don't think so. Did it get run without Australian Super's support? No, all right. it didn't. It went back to the ISA board and the ISA board resolved not to air it at that time. Attend to that document, Commissioner. Australian Super CEO report 6 September 16 is exhibit 5.93. That's ASU 0009 0002 1300. And then if we bring up ASU.0014.0002.3622. This is a report prepared by you to the Australian Super Board for a meeting on the 1st of March 2017? Yes, that's correct. And it concerns the ISA marketing campaign? Yes. And is it the case, do you sit on the ISA board? Yes, I do. All right. So what you're reporting back to on the board is, the Board of Australian Super, is where things are at with the development of 
the Fox and Hen House campaign. That's right. And I think you note there that issues that remain to be settled include the script of the advertisement. Yes. Timing of the advertisement. Yes. And sending a letter to the Prime Minister urging a change of tack on certain policy issues. Yes. And I think, unfortunately, we don't have the attachment, but what was the change of tack that the ISA board was seeking from the Prime Minister? Uh, in relation to the advertisement, to, to drop the proposal that um, had been pushed by the retail wealth management sector, in particular the banks, to remove the protections that exist in the default fund structure that then applied and, and currently still do apply. And when you're referring to the protections, can you be more specific about what you mean by that? Yes. So currently, awards and enterprise agreement, most awards and enterprise agreements have a superannuation clause. The superannuation clause will identify usually a small number of superannuation funds from which employers can select the default fund. Um, that's a process of negotiation between uh, trade unions representing um, workers and members of superannuation funds and employers. Um, the proposal was to uh, essentially strip superannuation from the industrial system and um, allow employers the unfettered right to choose the default fund that would apply at their workplace. Um, and in doing so, create um, the likelihood, based on uh, research that had been undertaken, that retail wealth management organisations, in particular the banks, would seek to leverage their business relationship with employers with a view to influencing them to choose, in the case of the banks, a bank-owned fund as the default fund to apply to the workplace. And the, the mis-selling, the cross-selling, the conflict of interest in particular that would apply through that model present a situation where the very great likelihood, indeed the express design objective of such a change, would be to see millions of Australians that would otherwise be in higher performing industry funds in poorer performing retail funds. We just go back to my question. The particular protection mechanism that you're referring to is that enterprise agreements and awards contain a superannuation clause. It's, is that the it, essence of it? it it's, that's part of it, but it's the preceding step that the parties involved in the negotiations of that clause, the ultimate outcome of which is the clause in the industrial instrument, comprise employers or employer representatives and trade unions representing the members. So there's a, an express member stake in the game. But the legislative change would be to remove a provision for superannuation from industrial awards and enterprise agreements. Correct. And in that case, employers would be free outside of those enterprise agreements and awards to choose what would be the default fund. Correct. And the concern that I think you're identifying as driving ISA and therefore Australian super is that this would mean that it would be possible for employers to select a, I'll call it a retail fund, rather than an industry fund. That's right. Um, most employers, in our experience, want to do the right thing by their employees and will be minded to choose the best fund for their employees. But um, as I said, we know um, with certainty that some of these institutions have sought to negotiate with uh, employers 
and sought to leverage a business banking relationship into a change of default fund applying at, at the workplace? Well, I, I understand the concern that you're identifying as driving the fund. You referred to research that had been undertaken. Yes. I don't think we need to go to that, but there were some, there were some PowerPoint presentations that ISA had prepared summarising some market research that had been done. Yes, that's right. And once the ad aired, it immediately attracted political attention. Do you agree? Uh, yes, it did. And it also attracted attention from APRA? Yes, it did. Although I, I didn't say immediate, and I think the point you were making before was APRA got in contact with Australian Super after an event that we probably strictly can't talk about because of parliamentary privilege. But in any event, APRA got in contact with Australian Super at a point in time. Yes. And in response to that query, you wrote back to APRA to explain the position of Australian Super. That's right. I, I tend to that document, Commissioner. Australian Super CEO report 1 March 17, ASU 0014 0002 3622, Exhibit 5.94. Mr Hodge, I'd be assisted if uh, attachment 1 to that uh, document were to be uh, uh, provided and tendered at some point. I would also be assisted if at some point uh, it can be made plain uh, whether there was at that time some uh, proposed legislative step uh, which was uh, underway to give effect to proposals of the kind of which Mr Silk has spoken. Uh, I, mean, I can think of ways in which the, uh, you could uh, achieve that result, but my febrile imagination to take up uh, Mr Silk's view may not be right. So I'd like to know what uh, uh, proposals were then uh, publicly on foot. There was, can I assist you in part yeah. with that, Commissioner? I'm not sure whether this is the particular piece of legislation that was a, of concern, but there was a bill which was Treasury Laws Amendment Improving Accountability and Member Outcomes in Superannuation Measures Number 2 Bill 2017, which I think allowed workers covered by, or if passed, would have allowed workers covered by enterprise agreements to choose their own super fund. Yes. Would that have does that sound like that was one of the pieces of legislation? Well, there are different views about that particular provision, but the, the Fox and the Hen House advertisement was not directed specifically to that. It was directed to uh, proposals that have been um, argued for for many years, um, but the, the political temperature around the issue had increased dramatically in the, uh, the months that we're speaking of, late 2016 into 2017. And the, um, the minister for superannuation had made plain that it was the government's intention to introduce legislation to that effect. But to do what? To change the Fair Work Act or to uh, the definition of industrial matter or what? Uh, well, that has changed, um, Commissioner. The, the means by which this might be implemented um, has changed over the years, but the, the proposal to achieve the end has, as I said, been advocated for some time. The, the mechanism to achieve it has changed on three occasions, to my knowledge. Yeah. Well, I, I, as I say, I will be assisted by knowing what uh, public proposal, if any, Yes. Uh, the answer may be uh, there was none or there were several. Uh, yes. But what public proposal, if any, was on the table at about the time, uh, and I think it may be as well to have uh, a couple of times identified, first at the time of uh, uh, this memorandum of February 17 and second at the time of the first airing of Fox and the Hen House. Yes. 
Well, the ad aired in about for the first time in about June of 2017. Yes, sound right. Yes. And after it aired, you received an information request from <coughs> APRA. Yes, that's right. And I might just show you a response. Can we bring up ASU.0009.0002.9102? So this is an email. I'm sure you've seen the unredacted version. This is an email back to a representative of APRA. Yes. And the request for information was about Australian Super's involvement in Fox and Hen House. That's correct. And you refer in paragraph two to some reports and advice about the matter, including about surveys demonstrating, and you refer to SMEs being vulnerable to approaches from their business bank to transfer default superannuation to a fund associated with the bank. Yes. And I think we have required, or the commission has, commissioner has required by notice production of those various documents and PowerPoint presentations. Commissioner, I didn't propose to bring those up now, but I might just tender them at a convenient time. Yes, if that's I don't, I don't think satisfactory. I'll leave to you whether we need to go to them in the hearing, but at some point they need to be in evidence. I, I don't think they are necessary to go to in the hearing. <coughs> and <coughs> it's then explained, and you see there at point four, the June 2000 and 17 board meeting agreed to participate in the campaign. Yes. And the reason that the board agreed to participate was said to be because it was consistent with Australian Super's obligations to members by assisting to retain and build upon the scale of the fund so that we can continue to provide an excellent offering to members. Yes. Uh, so there was both a a direct and an indirect issue here. Um, it was the fund's view, the board's view, <coughs> my own view as well, that if if this policy changed, uh, current members of the fund, some current members of the fund, were likely to leave the fund and go to a fund that we would say would provide. Uh, poorer experience and ultimately a poorer financial outcome for members, so those members would be worse off. And the remaining members of the fund uh, would have um, diminished economies of scale available to the fund to deploy on their behalf. So both a direct and an indirect impact. Was a possible effect, depending upon the framing of legislative change, also that Australian super might end up being the default fund for less employers? Is that the yes. point here? Yes. So that with the consequence that you have, it's not just losing existing members, it's losing the flow of members into the fund. Is that right? Yes, that's right. And is that, I just want to understand, are those all the only two relevant aspects of the effect on scale? One of which is losing the flow of members into the fund, the other of which is losing existing members? I can't think of anything else. No, I think that's right. And so that the Commissioner can see the logic such as it is behind the ad, the logic is, this is an ad targeted at, I think you said ultimately federal politicians. Well, the, the ultimate purpose was to uh, ensure that legislation was not passed that would diminish the financial outcomes of superannuation fund members, in particular Australian super members. So in that sense, the ultimate um, test is whether legislation passed. I understand. I just want to make sure we've identified all of the steps before we then test those right. steps. The first step is 
that it would discourage politicians from passing a certain type of legislation? Yes, yeah, so either of, by virtue of their own um, viewing of the advertisement and consideration of the issues or by virtue of others having viewed the advertisement and lobbying the politicians about it. The second step is the type of <coughs> legislation that you're talking about, independent of the particular form, is one that would change how the default system operated? That's correct. The third step is <coughs> that the types of changes contemplated to the default system would be disadvantageous to the flow of members into Australian Super Australian Super's fund? That's not the principal issue. The principal issue is that such a change would be to the disadvantage of the members of the fund. I, I understand. I, I think if we just step this through, though, mm -hmm. the reason that, in your view, it's a disadvantage to the members of the fund is because there is a potential decrease in the flow of new members into the fund. That's one part. That's one part. And another part is that members who are in the fund which Australian Super regards as high performing compared to other funds, yes. would leave the fund and join lower performing Correct. funds. Correct. Have we, in what we just laid out, encapsulated the full logic behind the ad? I think so, yes. From the perspective of Australian Super when it agreed to support it? Yes. All right. And attend to that document, Commissioner. Email silk to APRA 177 uh, 17 ASU 0009 0002 to exhibit 5.95. And can we then bring up ASU 0009 0002 This is your Chief Executive report dated the 8th of June 2017 but for the board meeting on the 23rd of June 2017. That's correct. And I think what has happened if we go to the second page we see Item six, which is Industry Super Australia. Yes. And ISA is seeking voluntary contributions of up to half a million dollars to the Fox and Hen House campaign. Yes. So this was not a campaign that was going to be covered by the regular quarterly contributions of the funds to ISA. That's correct. There was going to be a separate voluntary contribution for this campaign. Yes. And the board when it had, of Australian Super, when it had met in May, had already decided to support the campaign, is that right? Yes. And you are reporting back on the final outcome of that, that there's going to be a contribution of half a million dollars to the Fox and Hen House campaign? Yes. And you sit on the ISA board, so presumably you knew throughout May and June what was going on in relation to that? Yes. And that seems to be, in terms of the value of it, we see that last sentence, which is, the correspondence also confirms Australian Super's contribution to ISA's funding of, we see it's almost $5 million. Yes. Do you know whether the, fi the $500,000 was in addition to or separate from the $5 million? It was. <coughs> Pardon me, it was. It was in addition to? Correct. All right, so it was effectively an increase by one eleventh of the value of the contribution to ISA. Yes, yeah, so a one-off contribution of $500,000. And for this specific campaign? For this specific campaign. And therefore, was it approached by the board on the basis that it needed to satisfy itself that this specific campaign satisfied the sole purpose test? That's correct. And is there anything more to the reasoning as to how the board satisfied itself 
that this was this satisfied the sole purpose test than what we have the steps we have laid out. Uh, in, in what sense? Well, let's perhaps if we do the steps, but we do them in reverse, which maybe yep. helps to see the logic of it, <coughs> such as it is. If the if a member in I in Australian Super's view leaves the Australian Super Fund and joins a different fund, they might well end up with a lower return. Yes, that's and a Australian probable outcome. And Australian Super has a particular view that if they leave the fund and join a bank fund, they will end up with a lower return. That's a probable outcome. And also for members who stay with the fund, they are advantaged by scale and by a constant <coughs> flow of new members. Yes. If there is a change to the industrial relations system to change the ways in which default funds are selected under awards or enterprise agreements or whether they're selected at all under awards or enterprise agreements, that could increase the likelihood of a member of Australian Super moving to a different fund, to a retail fund. Is that right? Yes, and uh, suffering a corresponding financial loss. And also decrease the likelihood of new members joining the fund. Yes. Therefore, any action that might deter the passage of that type of legislation is something that maintains the retirement incomes or retirement outcomes of members of the fund? Yes. I just want to, yes. that's the logic, is yes, that right? Yes, that is the logic. And that is the logic that the board approved? <coughs> Correct. Was it any part of the board's consideration the related issue of whether there are legislative, whether there are changes to the CIS Act in respect of the number or percentage of independent directors? No. And, and, and go on. Um, the, the material words, in fact, I think um, the only material words in the advertisement um, from memory are the big banks want to get their hands on your super and they're putting pressure on our federal politicians to let them in. Those words go to default funds. They don't go to anything else. I tender that document, Commissioner. Australian Super CEO report 8 June 17 ASU 0009 0002 3530 exhibit 5.96. So the campaign started running in June of 2017 or yes, about then? About then. Do you recall when it finished? No, I'm afraid I don't. Do you know whether it was treated by ISA as a political donation or as a political matter that required declaration to the Electoral Commission? Yes, I believe they had advice to that effect. And that it was treated, therefore, as a political contribution to whom? Uh, I, don't, I don't know whether it was treated as a political contribution, but the, uh, the words at the end, um, authorised by David Whiteley, etc., are um, required by some particular federal agency for advertisements that are or might be seen to impinge in the political arena. I'm, I'm not aware of um, the expenditure being characterised as a political contribution. All right. You, you're not... Exactly how it was declared to the Electoral Commission is not something you're familiar with? No. Right. Are you aware of whether there was research done after the advertisement was run to determine how successful or otherwise it was? Yes. And was that done by Australian Super or by ISA? It was done by ISA. Can I, I want to show you a document so you can tell me whether this is the one. Can we see ISA.003.0001.0680? <coughs> Do you 
Is this, does that document look familiar to you? Yes, it does. Is this the product of the research that you're referring to? I believe so. All right, I might, if we go over to the second page, which is dot zero six eight one. Does that help? Does that look like it's the document you're thinking of? It doesn't help a lot, to be honest, but um, right. yes, I, th I think this is the document. All right. And are you able to, I can take you through the document if it helps, but are you able to summarise to the Commissioner what the outcome was of the research? Uh, well, I don't know what the particular question was here, but clearly there's been an increase in recognition, um, but I'm not sure of what. <laughs> All right, if we go to page dot zero six eight two. Yes. So this seems to be effectively evaluating the perception of industry funds as against retail funds or bank funds. Yes. And do you recall whether that was the thing that was being evaluated? I, I don't recall. All right. I'll, I'll tend to that document, Commissioner, and then I have some more general questions. Member information campaign, have we got a date on it anywhere, Mr Hodge? I'm told it's September 2017. September 17, ISA 0003, 0001, 0680, Exhibit 5.97. Do I understand, Mr Silk, you agree that uh, uh, surveys of this kind depend entirely on what question is asked? <laughs> yes, I, w I would acknowledge that, Commissioner. Oh, yes, Prime Minister had something. <laughs> to say about that at one stage, what, yes. What I'm trying to understand is whether the way in which Australian super would measure the success or otherwise of this campaign is concerned with whether and to what extent it has altered favourably or unfavourably the perception of banks as against industry super funds for the public or whether its success or otherwise is concerned ultimately with something entirely different, which is the likelihood that, and I think it's framed as federal politicians, but it presumably means certain cross-bench cross senators, the likelihood that certain cross-bench senators would or would not support legislative reform to the default system. Yes, it was squarely directed at the latter. Right. And in that respect then, was it regarded as a success or not? Uh, it's a, it's a, if that's the objective, it's a pretty binary view, and to date, it's been successful. Uh, or it's the objective that it was seeking to achieve has been achieved, whatever the contribution of the advertisement. Um, but it's a, a battle that's been won, not the war. The, um, Forces continue to seek to pursue that legislative change. Commissioner, I don't have any more questions for Mr. Silver. Can I just see if I can get the question right? Because until you get the question right, you don't know what the answer ought to be. The question's about payment for a form of political communication. That's the uh, uh, start of which we begin, isn't it? The ad is a form of political communication, seeking to influence uh, uh, members of parliament and their constituents uh, about uh, the legal uh, and regulatory regime of the country. Do we get that far, Mr Silk, or have I derailed at the very outset? Um, well, I, I would say that the first proposition is that the advertisement and the, the broader campaign that this is part of is very much a public policy issue. Oh, yeah. Uh, and, and the language of political communication harks back to my not so distant past, Mr Silk, and some constitutional ideas. Uh, but your 
Australian super made a payment to ISA for ISA uh, to prepare and broadcast an advertisement directed towards persuasion. That, that is correct. Thus far? Correct, yes. yes. The people to be persuaded, you said, ultimately were the members of parliament. Yes. Uh, intermediately, uh, you persuade members of parliament by persuading their constituents. Yes. If I wrap that up as payment for a form of political communication, I'm not seeking to uh, talk about partisan political yes. communication, at least not yet. You are just paying for a form uh, of persuasion of elected representatives and those who elect them. Yes. Can, can I make two points? Yes, please. Uh, the first is, uh, as I know you're aware, uh, superannuation is a very heavily regulated form of public policy. It exists by virtue of statute. The CIS legislation, the tax legislation, take away those who don't have a super system. So it's very heavily regulated. It's a creature of the federal parliament. Um, and so regulators, federal regulators and federal politicians are key players in the system by virtue of the design of the system. That's the first point. The second point is the way you've described it is correct and the same description, I think, could be uh, attributed to policy work, lobbying work, when there's interaction between an industry association and politicians. Uh, as I say at the moment, I'm concerned to formulate the question and if I get the question right, then at least there's a chance of getting the answer right. Yes. Get the question wrong and you'll go awry. But payment for that communication is payment for a communication directed to what the payer perceives to be the interests of present and future members. That's correct. Yeah. And then to expand the question out still further, so I'm cutting it up in bits. The question I think is, or maybe, that payment for a form of political communication directed to the perceived interests of to what are perceived to be the interests of present or future members, here you arrive at a fork in the road, either is not in the particular case or can never be, I think is the proposition that's being considered. Again, another fork in the road either is not or cannot ever be in the best interests of members. That's one formulation that uh, might be being alluded to. Or perhaps the other formulation is not in this particular case or cannot ever be for sole purposes of maintaining uh, retirement benefits for members. Now, I think that may be the underlying proposition that is uh, at play in this area. Now, I raise it now so that everybody later when we come to submissions can tell me how wrong I am, where I'm wrong and uh, how I've got it completely uh, wrong way up. Yes. Ms. Wright, I have any further questions. Can I just clarify, you're, you're not saying that's your positive proposition, you're saying that's the proposition that's put up yeah, for I, question. Yeah, I'm not embracing the proposition. I'm saying this is the proposition that I think is in play. Yes. Those who say that this cannot be done are, I think, ultimately saying one or other of those alternatives. But, uh, I don't want people running away thinking that uh, 
yes, I've come to some conclusion that this is not or cannot be uh, of this kind. I've reached no such conclusion uh, at all. I've reached no conclusion about any of these issues. Thank you, Commissioner. I don't have any further questions. Yes. No questions, Brian. Commissioner. Yes. Could Mr Silk be excused, Commissioner? Yes, thank you, Mr Silk. You may thank you. step down. You're thank excused. You. Now, Mr Hodge. How late would you like to sit, Commissioner? Well, uh, if we go through till 4.30, it'll give us another 20 minutes. Thank you. That would be good. Thank you, Commissioner. Yes. Could we... Can we just stand down for two minutes so we change? Yes, uh, I'll come back in a couple of minutes' time. Thank you, Commissioner.